Charmaine Superville, uh, for welcoming me, welcoming me so warmly to the board and for their hard work year in and year out with the important task before us. Our next planned meeting will be here in the Landmarks Preservation Commission Conference Room on April 13th, starting at 9.30 a.m. The public can also live stream our meetings uh, on our YouTube channel at youtube.gov forward slash Okay, great. Uh, uh, YouTube.com forward slash rent guidelines board. Information on this meeting will be posted on our website, nyc.gov forward slash RGB, in our meeting section, and will be sent to everyone on our email list. If you're interested in receiving email updates about the RGB meetings and hearings, please go to our homepage and click on RGB email updates under quick links. Today, staff will present the 2023 Income and Expense Study. A copy of the report is in your meeting folder. We have copies of the report here today, uh, and we'll make it available electronically after the meeting on the research link on the RGB homepage. In addition to the report, uh, there are also non-public per diem forms in your folder. If you have any questions on these forms, of course, please see Andrew. Please note that the Annual Conflicts of Interest Board financial disclosure report filing period began this past Monday on March 27th and will end on April 21st. Staff had emailed out the COIB packets last week, and I understand that you've all received them, but if not, or if you have any questions, again, please see Andrew. With that, let me uh, now introduce Brian Hoberman, the RGB Research Director, who will be presenting the 2023 Income and Expense Study. And I'll say, uh, as, as David always did, that we should feel free, of course, to ask questions as we go. Um, and of course, we'll, we'll, we'll have our questions afterwards um, at the close of his presentation. I, I want to do two pieces of housekeeping. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. So before we start, so the sound wasn't working. So okay. you just reiterate who's here. You don't have to call the other. Understood. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we have quorum. We have Rob Ehrlich. Uh, we have Alex Schwartz. We have Christina Smith, Adon Soltren and Shayla Garcia in addition to myself. Great, thank you. Um, so just two other uh, uh, quick announcements uh, uh, before we begin. First, um, we have the schedule of our meetings. We haven't set a schedule of our hearings yet. I would like for us to have that conversation on the 13th at our next meeting. Um, uh, uh, I, I'll just say for, for me, I, I, I hope we are returning uh, into in-person meetings, but. Uh, 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 you know, we'll have that conversation, and I think it's a good conversation for us to have. Um, and I know, Andrew, you're looking at um, sort of options, and, and so um, that's an important conversation for us, and I, I look forward to having that. Um, and then the second thing I just want to say, Andrew, if you could just say a word about what you anticipate in terms of the next reports we're going to get. Um, uh, I understand that the income and affordability study is next. Right. So at our next meeting on the 13th, we'll have the income and affordability study. Um, the meeting after that. We'll have the price index of operating co costs and our mortgage uh, survey Great. report. So. Thank you so much. All right, with that, Brian, let me hand it over to you. Oh, unless, sorry, oh, Don, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, so, excuse me, I forgot to mention. So, Mike, you want to have a There we go. Am I? Are we good? Yeah. All right. Um, so excuse me, Mr. Chairperson, just as a preliminary note, I wanted to see if it was possible, well, first welcome um, to the board. Um, and I think at any time where there's change, right, and we're looking, many of us are, are newer to this than others, um, I think it's important to sort of ground ourselves in the purpose of this process and the purpose of the board. And so I was just, I was gonna offer up, Mr. Chairperson, that prior to the presentation of the report, if I may read into the record um, some of the language from the actual rent stabilization law, which created the Rent Guidelines Board. So section 26501 of the uh, New York State Administrative Code entitled Findings and Declaration of Emergency. The council hereby finds that a serious public emergency continues to exist in the housing of a consider considerable number of persons within the city of New York and will continue to exist after April 1st, 1974, that such emergency necessitated the intervention of federal, state, and local government in order to prevent speculative, unwarranted, and abnormal increases in rents, that there continues to an exist an acute shortage of dwellings, which creates a special hardship to persons and families occupying rental housing, that the legislation enacted in 1971 by the state of New York, removing controls on housing accommodations as they become vacant, has resulted in sharp increases in rent levels in many instances, 
that the existing and proposed cuts in federal assistance and housing to housing programs threaten the, a virtual end to the creation of new housing, thus prolonging the present emergency. That unless residential rents and evictions continue to be regulated and controlled, disruptive practices and abnormal conditions will produce serious threats to the public health, safety, and general welfare. That to prevent such perils to health, safety, and welfare, preventative action by the Council continues to be imperative that such action is necessary in order to prevent exactions of unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive rents and rental agreements and to forestall profiteering speculation and other disruptive practices tending to produce threats to the public health, safety, and general welfare. That the transition from regulation to a normal market of free bargaining between landlord and tenant, while still the objective of state and city policy, must be administered with due regard for such emergency and that the policy herein expressed is now administered locally within the City of New York by an agency of the city itself, pursuant to authority conferred by Chapter 21 of the Laws uh, 1962. I'll continue, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, the Council further finds that prior to the adoption of Local Law 16 and 51 of 1969, many owners of housing accommodations in multiple dwellings not subject to the provisions of the City Rent and Rehabilitation Law enacted pursuant to said enabling authority, either because they were constructed after 1947 or because they were decontrolled due to monthly rental of $250 or more for other reasons, were demanding exorbitant and unconscionable rent increases as a result of an aforesaid emergency, which led to a continuing restriction of available housing as evidenced by the 1968 vacancy survey by the United States Bureau of the Census that prior to the enactment of said local laws, such increases were being exacted under stress of prevailing conditions of inflation and an acute housing shortage, resulting from the sharp decline in private residential construction brought ab about by a combination of local and national factors. That such increases in demands were causing severe hardship to tenants of, mu of such accommodations and were uprooting longtime city residents from their communities. That recent studies established that the acute housing shortage continues to exist that there has been a further decline in private residential construction due to existing and proposed cuts in federal assistance to housing programs, that unless such accommodations are subject to reasonable rent and eviction limitations, disruptive practices and abnormal conditions will produce serious threats to the public health, safety, and general welfare, and that such conditions constitute a grave emergency. Now, if you'll just indulge me, there's only one additional paragraph that I would like to read, uh, Mr. Chairperson, and it is about how the Rent Guidelines Board should go about sort of analyzing this issue. It's section B um, to 26510. The Rent Guidelines Board shall establish annual, annually guidelines for rent adjustments. And in determining whether rents for housing accommodation subject to the Emergency Tenant Protection Act of 1974 uh, or this law shall be adjusted uh, to consider among other things, one, the economic condition of the residential real estate industry in the affected area, including such factors as the prevailing and projected, little i, real estate taxes, sewer and water rates, gross operating maintenance costs, uh, insurance rates, governmental fees, cost of fuel and labor costs. And then another section, cost of availability of a financing, including effective rates of interest, subsection, overall supply of housing accommodations and overall vacancy rates, and then separately, relevant data from the current and projected cost of living indices for the affected area. And then the last subsection, three, says such other data as may be available to it. Now I bring this up so that we can all recenter ourselves as to what the letter of the law that created this board and body was intended to do. Um, and we can argue or debate about, about much of what I've just described in terms of housing crises and affordability. Um, but I want to highlight that last section particularly because it does say such other data as may be available to it. And as you know, Chair, Mr. Chairperson, you as the chair have um, a lot of discretion and, and authority to bring in or sort of leave out additional data as may be available. And so I encourage you, considering this board has been doing this for I don't know how many decades right now, right? 54, last 54 years, I'm on. Um, if we want to commit to a fair process and uh, an open process, I encourage you to rely on that, that last portion. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Any other comments before we begin? Great. Oh, Shayla, please go ahead. Well, I don't know if we should leave it for the rest of the board discussion or if that's going to include the report, but I wanted to bring up the auto borough hearings and making sure that we are going to keep doing that. It's not in our current schedule, but I don't know if this chair currently is committed to making sure we have auto borough hearings in all four 
on a borough except for Staten Island because there's not much space there. Um, I'm open to also going to Staten Island if that's necessary, um, as well as making sure we have interpretation in the languages that folks uh, need. And is that something that you're committed to continuing as we go into this year? Uh, absolutely. As I said before, I, I really want us to have a conversation as a board about that. Um, but personally, and I can't speak for the board, I can only speak for myself, I think in person, uh, as we did before, the, um, you know, there's great value to that. Um, I think there are considerations about whether we would want to make available as well some remote option uh, in addition, but, but I do think in-person is important. Um, so thank you for that, Shayla. Great. Any, anything else? Okay, great. Really appreciate it. Brian, please. Okay. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the new chair. Um, I will present the 2023 Income and Expense Study. Uh, local Law 63 requires owners of apartment buildings to file RPI statements with the Department of Finance annually. This year's study reflects the appreciable impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the city's economy. While certain types of properties are exempt from filing RPI forms, such as most residential only buildings with fewer than 11 units, the mandate produces detailed financial information on thousands of buildings containing stabilized units. To ensure only buildings that contain stabilized units are analyzed, the Department of Finance releases data to us only after matching RPIE data with building registration data obtained from Homes and Community Renewal, HCR. The data used in this year's study includes 14,904 buildings with 695,098 units. The data is used to compute average revenue and costs for a moment in time view. We also conduct a longitudinal analysis of 14,102 buildings containing 657,993 units. This illustrates the change from 2020 to 2021 among the same set of buildings. There were two changes in methodology made this year. The previous versions of the study examined data based on whether a building was built before 1947 or after 1946. Beginning this year, the INE study will now stratify buildings based on whether they were constructed prior to 1974 or on or after January 1st, 1974. With passage of the Emergency Tenant Protection Act of 1974, the ETPA, buildings containing six or more residential units constructed prior to 1974 are typically rent stabilized. However, generally speaking, buildings constructed or extensively renovated after 1973 are subject to rent stabilization only because the owner has agreed to receive tax benefits in exchange for entering the rent stabilization program. Once these abatements end, the units are no longer rent stabilized. The second methodological change in, in this study is, is, this use, is the use of audit adjusted expenses. In past years, expenses were adjusted by roughly 8% in certain circumstances based on a 1992 DOF audit of a small number of buildings. The new method by which expense figures are adjusted is based on the difference between the weighted average operating costs among buildings that did not have any DOF assessment adjustments compared to the weighted average operating costs used in the main data set. While not a perfect replacement for an updated audit, RGB staff believes it is a more accurate adjustment because it uses current expense data. This year's new cost adjustment reduces expenses in certain circumstances by 4.94%. However, keep in mind that adjustments to expenses are only made when specifically referred to in the report. If no mention of an expense adjustment is made, unadjusted expenses are used. In 2021, rent stabilized property owners collected monthly rent averaging $1,495 per unit per month, and the median citywide in 2021 was $1,285. Units and buildings constructed before 1974 rented for less on average. $1,343 per month than those in buildings constructed after 1973, $2,149 per month. At the borough level, the average monthly rent in buildings containing stabilized units was $1,913 in Manhattan, at 2356 in Core Manhattan, at $1,358 in Upper Manhattan, it was $1,498 in Brooklyn, $1,439 in Queens, $1,122 in the Bronx, and $1,041 on Staten Island. Average monthly rent in the city, excluding Cormann Hatton, was $1,337. Many building owners supplement income from their apartment rents by selling services, as well as renting commercial space. In 2021, building owners in the city earned an average of $1,667 per unit per month, 
the citywide median was $1,395. Pre-1974 buildings earned $1,495 per unit, and those in post-73 properties earned $2,409 per unit. Income was highest in Manhattan at $2,245 per unit. In Core Manhattan, it was $2,746, and in, it was $1,617 in Upper Manhattan. In the remainder of the city, Brooklyn's gross income was $1,603, followed by Queens at $1,537, the Bronx at $1,247, and Staten Island at $1,173. Monthly income per unit in the city, excluding Core Manhattan, was $1,463. This graph shows that average monthly income and rent were the highest in Core Manhattan and lowest in Staten Island. Average income is in maroon and average rent in blue. Uh, all the graphs that I will have in the presentation are also in the report if you want to look at it with more clarity. Now, gross income encompasses all rent, all revenue from rent, including apartment rent, commercial rent, such as retail space and cell phone towers, sale of services such as laundry, parking, and vending, and all the other operating income. The sale of services and commercial income accounted for 10.3% of the total income earned by building owners in 2021 citywide. That was up three-tenths of a percentage point from the previous year. By borough, income earned from services and commercial rents as a percentage of total income in the building was 14.8% in Manhattan. It was broken down into 16% in Upper Manhattan and 14.2% in Core Manhattan. It was 11.3% in Staten Island, 10% in the Bronx, 6.6% in Brooklyn, and 6.4% in Queens. In the city, excluding Core Manhattan, the proportion was 8.6%. The average monthly operating and maintenance costs for units was $1,091 per unit in 2021. The median monthly cost was $974. Costs were lower in units in pre-74 structures at $1,059 and higher among post-73 buildings at $1,228. By borough, average costs were highest in Manhattan at $1,560. Within Manhattan, costs for units located in Core Manhattan averaged $1,918 a month, and costs in Upper Manhattan were $1,112. In the other boroughs, Queens average costs were $996. In Brooklyn, it was $940. The Bronx, $833. And Staten Island was $774. Excluding Core Manhattan, the average monthly operating cost in the remainder of the city was $940. As I discussed earlier, this year's INE study changed the way adjustments were made to expenses. In certain circumstances, this year's new cost adjustment reduces expenses by 4.94%. As I noted earlier, keep in mind that adjustments to expenses are only made in a few specific parts of the report. Adjustment of the 2021 RPIE operating and maintenance costs of 1,091 by the result of this year's cost adjustment results in an average O&M cost $1,037. And just as buildings without commercial space typically generate less revenue on a per unit basis than stabilized properties with commercial space, operating expenses of these buildings tend to be lower on average than in residents than in buildings, I'm sorry, with a mixture of uses. In 2021, average adjusted O&M cost for residential only buildings was $1,001. When applying the new expense adjustment, average adjusted O&M cost for these buildings was $952. Thus, residential only buildings have average adjusted O&M costs that are 8.2% lower than all buildings. This graph breaks down expenses by component and further splits them into pre-74 and post-73 categories. The largest share of expenses went towards taxes followed by maintenance and administrative costs. In post-73 buildings, in the graph in blue, those buildings spent more on maintenance, administration, labor, utility, and miscellaneous costs. Pre-74 buildings in maroon spent more on taxes, fuel, and insurance. And the average expenses per unit per month for all buildings is shown in green. Buildings where operating and maintenance costs exceed gross income are defined as distressed. In 2021, 8.8% of buildings were considered distressed. That was 2.3 percentage points higher than the prior year's 
by borough. 58.8% of distressed buildings are in Manhattan, while the remainder are in the Bronx at 15.7%, Brooklyn 14.5%, Queens 10.5%, and Staten Island 0.5%. Since 1990, when 13.9% of stabilized properties were considered distressed, the proportion of distressed buildings declined to as low as 4.9% in 2016. The proportion of distressed properties has since risen in each of the last five years to the most recent 8.8%, the highest level since 2009. Revenues exceed operating costs in nearly all buildings, yielding funds that can be used for mortgage payments, capital improvements, and or pre-tax profit. The amount of income remaining after O&M expenses are paid is typically referred to as net operating income, NOI. In 2021, apartments in buildings containing stabilized units generated $576 in NOI per month, with units in post-war, post-73 buildings earning more, $1,181 per month than those in pre-74 buildings, $436 per month. Average monthly NOI in residential-only properties citywide was $500 per unit in 2021. That was 13.2% lower than the average for all buildings containing stabilized units. In 2021, average NOI was significantly different by borough. Average monthly per unit NOI is greater among stabilized properties in Manhattan at $685 than for those in the other boroughs, which was $663 in Brooklyn, $541 in Queens, $413 in the Bronx, $399 in Staten Island. There was a notable difference when looking at NOI on a subborough level in Manhattan. Core Manhattan properties earned an average of $828 per unit per month in NOI which was 64% greater than properties in Upper Manhattan, which earned an average NOI of $505. The monthly NOI average calculated citywide, excluding Core Manhattan, was $523. Another way to evaluate the financial condition of buildings that contain stabilized units is by measuring the ratio of expenses to revenues. Looking at unadjusted operating expenses, the cost-income ratio in 2021 was 65.4% using the newly updated expense adjustment method the expense adjusted cost income ratio in 2021 was 62.2%. This means that on average owners of rent stabilized property spent roughly 62.2 cents out of every dollar on, of revenue on operating and maintenance costs in 2021. Rent income costs uh, and costs were on, on average higher in core Manhattan which is shown on the left. Outside Core Manhattan, average revenue and cost figures are lower and have different expense to revenue ratios. In 2021, the adjusted cost income ratio in the city outside of Core Manhattan was 61.1%. That was 5.3 percentage points lower than the cost income ratio for building in Manhattan's core, which was 66.4%. This is only the second time in the survey's history that the cost income ratio was greater in Core Manhattan than in the rest of the city. This graph shows the inflation adjusted change citywide in income, rent, expenses, and NOI over a period of over three decades. Between 1990 and 2021, income, which is the top maroon line, cumulatively increased and inflation adjusted 40%. Rent, the second line from the top in green, rose 40.5%. Costs, the third line in blue, grew 35.3%, and net operating income, represented by the bottom line, increased over this period by 49.9%. These graphs represent the, the same time period as the graph on the last slide, but break it down by borough. It shows that while average inflation adjusted income, rent, costs, and NOI figures are far higher in Manhattan, the percentage increase in NOI since 1990 was the lowest in Manhattan among the boroughs. Brooklyn at the top right saw the largest NOI increase over this period, with NOI more than doubling between 1990 and 2021, rising 171%. The Bronx at the bottom right had the second highest NOI increase, rising 81%. Queens at the bottom left experienced NOI growth 
of 76%. And finally, Manhattan, shown in the top left, saw inflation-adjusted NOI grow 14% since 1990. And just as a reminder, all, like I said earlier, all these graphs are in the report itself for easier reading. We'll now move on to the second part of the INE study, which is the longitudinal analysis. The longitudinal sample encompasses properties that filed RPI forms reflecting conditions in both 2020 and 2021. By conducting the longitudinal analysis, we can more accurately track changes year to year in the same set of buildings. Average rent collections in buildings containing stabilized units fell by 1.2% from 2020 to 2021. Rent collections in pre-74 buildings fell at a slower rate, down six-tenths of a percent, compared to post-73 buildings, which declined by 2.6%. However, rent collections on average fell among large 100-plus unit buildings, declining 3.2%, while rent collections grew four-tenths of a percent in 11 to 19 unit buildings and grew three-tenths of a percent in 20 to 99 unit buildings. Examining the change in rent by borough, rent collections rose in Staten Island, up 3.1%, the Bronx up 2.4%, and Brooklyn up 1%. However, rent collections declined 5% in Manhattan and two-tenths of a percent in Queens. Within Manhattan, core Manhattan rents fell more, down 6%, while upper Manhattan rents fell by 2.8%. By contrast, rent collections in the city, excluding core Manhattan, increased a half a percent, and median rent citywide declined slightly down a tenth of a percent. At the neighborhood level, the largest collected rent increases occurred in East Tremont, Belmont, the Bronx, up 7.6 percent, North Shore, Staten Island, up 5.2 percent, Hunts Point, Longwood in the Bronx, up 5.1 percent, Kingsbridge Heights, Moshaloo, Norwood, the Bronx, up 5 percent, and Hillcrest Fresh Meadows, Queens, up 4.2%. The largest increase in Brooklyn was in East Flatbush, up 3.5%. The only Manhattan neighborhood that experienced rent growth was Central Harlem, up 1.4%. However, the remaining third of community districts experienced a decline in average rents. The largest decline citywide occurred in nine Manhattan neighborhoods, with the largest in the financial district, down 10.6%. The Upper East Side down 8.7%, East Harlem down 8.3%, and Stytown Turtle Bay down 7.9%. The largest decline in Brooklyn was in Park Slope Carroll Gardens down 2.8%. The largest in Queens was in Astoria down 1.5%. A list of all the neighborhoods and how much their rent changed can be found in the reports Appendix 13. The average total income comprising apartment rents, commercial rents, and sales of services fell two-tenths of a percent from 2020 to 2021. Revenue fell in post-73 buildings down 1.3 percent, but rose among the pre-74 buildings up two-tenths of a percent. Around the city, income grew in every borough except Manhattan. Income grew the most on Staten Island, up 3.7 percent followed by the Bronx, up 3.1%, Brooklyn, up 1.7%, and Queens, up four-tenths of a percent. By contrast, the Manhattan income fell 3.5%, falling 4.9% in core Manhattan and four-tenths of a percent in upper Manhattan. Total income in the city, if you exclude core Manhattan, rose 1.5%, and median income citywide rose slightly up a tenth of a percent. Average operating expenses rose 5.2 percent from 2020 to 2021. Post 73 buildings saw a larger increase in expenses, up 5.5 percent, while pre 74 buildings experienced a 5.2 percent increase in expenses. The increase in operating costs varied by borough. Costs grew the most in the Bronx, up 5.8 percent, followed by Manhattan and Brooklyn, both up 5.3 percent. Queens up 4.5%, and Staten Island up 1.6%. Up Within Manhattan, Upper Manhattan costs grew more, rising 7.4%, while costs grew 4.3% in Core Manhattan. Operating costs in the city, excluding Core Manhattan, rose by 5.6%, and the median citywide expenses grew 
4.8%. It could be useful to compare the cost changes calculated from RPIA data with the price and cost data from the price index of operating costs, which has been adjusted to match time periods between the two. The adjusted PIOC is in blue and the RPI data in maroon. The graph shows that the income and expense data grew at varying rates compared to the price index over this period. In the most recent year, the PIOC grew by 3.9% from 2020 to 2021, the same period as a 5.2% increase in I and E costs. Net operating income refers to the earnings that remain after O&M expenses are paid, but before payment of income tax, capital improvements, and debt service, citywide NOI and buildings containing rent stabilized apartments decreased by 9.1 percent between 2020 and 2021. Citywide NOI in post-73 buildings fell 7.5 percent, while in older pre-war buildings it declined by 10.1 percent. The average change in NOI from 2020 to 2021 varied around the city. NOI increased in Staten Island, where it rose 8.1 percent. However, NOI declined in the remaining boroughs, falling the most in Manhattan, down 19.1 percent. Within Manhattan, NOI fell 21 percent in core Manhattan and 14.8 percent in upper Manhattan. Elsewhere, NOI declined 6.3 percent in Queens, 2.8 percent in Brooklyn, 1.9 percent in the Bronx. Monthly NOI in the city outside of core Manhattan fell 5.1 one percent. At the community district level, NOI declined in 85 percent of the city's neighborhoods. However, NOI did increase in six neighborhoods. The largest increase occurred in the north shore of Staten Island, up 21.3 percent, followed by Hillcrest Fresh Meadows, Queens, up 4.1 percent, East Flatbush, Brooklyn, up 4 percent. The largest increase in the Bronx occurred in High Bridge, South Concourse, rising 1.1 percent, not a single Manhattan district saw NOI rise. NOI fell in 46 neighborhoods and was unchanged in two. The largest declines occurred in 11 Manhattan neighborhoods, with the largest in the financial district down 34.1%, the Upper East Side down 29.6%, and Stytown Turtle Bay down 28.8%. The largest decline in Queens occurred in Astoria, falling 10.8%. The largest Bronx decline was in Throgs Neck Co-op City, down 10.7%. And the largest Brooklyn decline was in Park Slope Carroll Gardens, down 9.6%. And as with the rent changes, all, a list of all the neighborhoods and how much NOI change can be found in Appendix 13 in the report. Until this point, the study, this study has examined buildings that contain at least one stabilized unit. RGB board members have asked staff to examine buildings based on the proportion of stabilized units in each building. The RGB requested that the Department of Finance prepare supplemental data for buildings that fall into three groupings, which are not mutually exclusive. Buildings that contain at least 50% stabilized units, at least 80% stabilized units, and 100% stabilized units, that is, all residential units in the building are stabilized. Citywide, 53% of buildings that contain at least one stabilized unit are 100% stabilized. However, there is a significant difference between core Manhattan compared to the rest of the city. Buildings that are 100% stabilized comprise 68% of buildings containing at least one stabilized unit in the city outside of core Manhattan compared to just 16% in core Manhattan alone. This table shows the 2021 cost income ratios based on a building's proportion of stabilized units broken down into three categories, citywide, core Manhattan, and the city excluding core Manhattan. Among buildings containing at least one stabilized unit, the cost income ratio in core Manhattan is 69.8%. That's 5.6 percentage points higher than the 64.3% in the city outside of core Manhattan. However, however, among 50% plus stabilized buildings, the core Manhattan cost income ratio is 7.7 percentage points lower than the rest of the city. Among 80% or more stabilized buildings, the gap grows to 4.1 percentage points. And in buildings that are entirely stabilized, the core Manhattan ratio is once again greater than the rest of the city with a 1.4 uh, percentage point difference. <clears throat> 
as discussed earlier, there was a 9.1% decline in NOI among buildings containing at least one stabilized unit. However, as the proportion of stabilized units in a building increases, the decline in NOI typically gets smaller. Among 50% plus stabilized buildings, NOI declined 8.6%. In 80% plus buildings, NOI declined 7%. And among 100% stabilized buildings, NOI declined 4%. Comparing Core Manhattan to the rest of the city, a similar trend occurs in Core Manhattan. Among 100% stabilized buildings, NOI fell 16.7%. While among 100% stabilized buildings in the city outside of Core Manhattan, NOI fell 3.3%. Looking at the proportion of buildings in distress, similar to the main analysis, there is a large difference between Core Manhattan and the rest of the city. Among buildings containing 50% or more stabilized units, 16.1% of a building in Core Manhattan were distressed compared to 6.2% elsewhere in the city, a 10 percentage point difference. And among entirely stabilized buildings, 15.9% of Core Manhattan was distressed, while 6.1% was distressed outside of Core Manhattan in the rest of the city, a 9.9 .9 percentage point difference and the numbers may be rounded. So to sum up this year's income and expense study, in 2021, city's average monthly rent was $1,495, average income was $1,667, average operating costs was $1,091, and the average NOI was $576 per unit per month. The adjusted cost income ratio citywide in 2021 was 62.2%, and in Core Manhattan, the ratio was 66.4%, which was 5.3 percentage points higher than the 61.1% in the rest of the city. Longitudinally, from 2020 to 2021, the citywide cost income ratio increased 3.2 percentage points. Rental income decreased an average of 1.2%. Total income declined by an average of 2 tenths of a percent. Operating costs rose an average of 5.2%. And because expenses rose and income fell, the NOI declined 9.1% citywide. The decline in NOI was most significant in Core Manhattan, where it fell 21%. By contrast, NOI in the remainder of the city fell 5.1% over the same period. Thank you uh, for your time, and I will now take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, let me just offer one reflection, then I'd love to open it up to the board. Um, Brian, one thing, two things that are striking about this. First of all, I think the methodological change this year to break out the pre, um, and maybe we could turn the lights on, uh, although there's a, uh, a nice atmosphere here, but um, uh, uh, the pre-73, sorry, pre-74, post-73 breakdown, I think, is, is very helpful as I've looked over data from past years, and I think it gives us a, a better way of getting our handle uh, around what is happening. Um, and, and at various points in the report, you single out residential-only buildings, which, again, I think is a helpful denominator. Um, and I'm wondering if you can clarify at some point the overlap, because um, I didn't see it between or, or the subset of pre-74 buildings that are residential-only, because I think that's a, a data point that, that would be helpful. Um, the one other thing I want to say, just to, uh, uh, as I've been thinking about this, um, uh, is that, that we're looking at data uh, that uh, cross-sectionally are, uh, uh, you know, 2021, uh, and longitudinally the differences between 20, uh, 2020 and 2021, and obviously we're looking at a picture of the portfolio uh, really at the height of the disruption of the pandemic. And um, we'd love for us to have a conversation about what uh, data we will be looking at and what op opportunities you can share with us to contextualize that and to, to help us understand where the market may have moved in the intervening two years on, on a variety of levels. So I think this is obviously uh, critically important and it's important to have apples to apples comparisons for us to work with. Um, but I also think it's important as we contemplate uh, what we're going to be doing for next year to, to, to think ahead to that, that as well. So maybe you could just answer that first question and then let me open it up and um, I'll have more later, but I want to make sure we hear from the board. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the actual in, in the report itself. I'll have to look it up, the number of pre-74 buildings that are residential only. Uh, yeah, 
uh, the pre-73, post-74 data, and as well the change to break out the percentage of stabilized units. Um, and um, so those are great adjustments, but as the chair said, we're lagging in the data. The, um, I noticed the income did improve, and I would say that that's predominantly the ERAP, the tail of the beginning of the ERAP, so maybe the midway point of some of the ERAP collections. Um, I don't know, maybe Rob, you can give your opinion, like what stage you think we're in the ERAP, maybe the, talk about a baseball analogy since it's opening day, but maybe like the eighth inning, you know, here in terms no, of. No, I think it's, it's basically we're at the, we're at the tail end. We're at, you know, yeah. I mean, so those monies that are coming in right now don't, don't really, I mean, well, let's take a step back. We're still dealing with 2021 numbers, yeah. which was ERAP then, which doesn't deal with what at least the owners that we're dealing with, what they're dealing with now. Yeah. Um, you know, which is high arrears balances. Um, no you know, more ERAP. No more ERAP. Yeah. Or minimal amount of ERAP. Um, you're dealing with one-shot deals at a, at a limited number to recoup those, whatever arrears balances there might be, which are still showing up on the ledger. Um, you're actually in some situations asking, we're being asked, you know, from legal service providers as part of a negotiation to take lesser rent. Yeah. To uh, accommodate for city FAPs or some other state agent, state programs, but th I think those things would be, you know, those different types of programs which help recoup monies that have been, for all intents and purposes, lost. Yeah. Would um would, you know, would be something further to explore. You know, as as we analyze as the data. Yeah. If I if I may just quickly uh, add something to that. So I, I don't know if it's fair necessarily to say that we're in the eighth or ninth or in extra innings with ERAP at this point. I mean, the portal just closed. What in November, January, 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 January fifteenth. Thank you. Um, and so while I understand that obviously there may be a, there may be decline or sharper decline in the number, number of applications, I don't actually have the number of of applications that have paid out yet, and I think that, you know, that's that's data that we can probably get our hands on from Otada. Ot Ot I mean, I think the other point that I would bring up is that you mentioned accommodating lesser rents that then become legal rents because preferential rents are no longer, you know. I wasn't, I wasn't saying preferential because what we're dealing with, what I'm talking about is, like, you know, you know city preps is, you know, is a mm -hmm. subsidy program. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with city preps has certain thresholds, certain limits for two family, for three family, for one family. So maybe it's fifteen hundred dollars, but the legal the legal rent, rent stabilized rent is eighteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. We're being asked to take fifteen hundred dollars so we can accommodate the city theft, which is less income. Right. And so I think that proves that, that maybe the market is not there. Not because that. right, but we don't know the opposite either. No. When we look at the DACR data and preferential rents and the flow after the rent laws, I think we'll get a better picture of what's happening. I'll just say on this, I think it's helpful for us to then ask what data are available and what we can do to sort of shed light on this. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry. The income and affordability study will have updated numbers Great. for uh, ERAP. So applications. But wait, but, but, what the Andrew, but what, through what year, though? Is that present? Uh, to the most current that we have. Okay. March 2020. So oh, that's great. More current than everything we're seeing right yes. now. So, yeah. so let me make a couple other observations. You know, uh, one is this period was when there was a rent freeze in effect, right? This is from the COVID rent freeze in 2020, I think, and then the and also 2021 when we had the rent freeze for the first six months. So you'd expect you know flat flat rent, uh, very little income growth. 
The other thing that really struck me is it seems like much of the decline in income had to do with the uh, market rate units. So the rent, it was interesting that except for core Manhattan, and it's not really clear what's going on there, that there was less of a decrease in NOI, less of a decrease in income in the, presumably, the market rate units. And so that may be related very much to, to COVID. So I think in looking at um, the decrease in NOI, which is pretty pervasive, it's also tempered to some extent by the fact that a lot of it is driven by market rate phenomenon. But it's still pretty striking how pervasive the decrease in NOI is. Uh, I, sorry, I just, and, and it was your, your point, your first point you made, it was interesting. You can actually look at the chart on pay, the table on page seven that shows the impact of the RGB rent index, the guidelines, which shows that there was a point, the guideline during this period reflected a 0.8 increase in rent. However, the RPA rent growth that is taken from the Department of Finance shows a 1.2% decline, so it shows them going in opposite directions, which you can, which means the impact of the guidelines. Um, it was probably, it was probably uh, the other reasons for the rent decline beyond the guideline changes during the I'm, I, I feel like, like everyone who was watching the news during this crisis or COVID in general, I feel like we all heard a lot about the impact of commercial spaces, specifically in Manhattan. And I feel like, can you, the report sort of goes through it, but can you talk a little bit about that overall impact to some of the numbers that we're looking at? You mentioned it a few times around uh, the core of Manhattan. You saw in a decreasing income, but not necessarily, that it seemed very linked to me to the 10% drop of commercial collections specifically. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, we do have collected rent. We do have information about rent and income and I, I, yeah, I would say uh, that, you know, certainly Manhattan has been more impacted by the decline in commercial income than the rest of the city since, um, you know, I know that based on, it's not reported in this, but anecdotally, I know that commercial income has been hit hard and, uh, and has continued to, to lag in terms of uh, collections or vacancies. I just wanted to bring up that, you know, elected officials in Manhattan specifically are thinking more creatively about how to use commercial spaces, potentially even turning it into residential. And so I feel like that is part of a conversation for us to consider as like the data evolves and we see the impact of COVID, the impact of some of these changes in the market itself, uh, not just on, the on spaces, but you know, I am looking forward to thinking about um, and hearing more about the income and affordability piece and overcrowding in housing and how that has impact on what we're looking at. Because expenses will then really go up if people can't afford their own units and more people are doubling and tripling up in units. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what that data looks like and how we sort of balance that up with what we're hearing um, on the income and expense report. I think just back to the, uh, the core Manhattan decline sort of piece as in the context of the pandemic, I think what's interesting here, right, with the 21% NOI decline in core Manhattan as opposed to the 5.1% everywhere else, I mean, there was an article that also came out in, that, in the Times this morning in the context of immigration. Uh, there was a census, it was talking about the census and, and during the pandemic, like immigration and, and um, sort of which counties in the U.S. lost the most folks, like people fleeing from there. Manhattan registered 100,000 people who actually fled during the pandemic. Um, Manhattan specifically is the county, right? So when we're looking at this, and we're looking at the mixed rate buildings that we're talking about, right? I think a lot of the, the, the loss in the income attributable here is to those mixed rate units. Um, and when you have 100,000 people that have, have left, and I think the number was a 17,000 one of coming back. I mean, I think therein lies some of this, this difference, right? I mean, that the, the fact that obviously folks who lost their jobs or couldn't ma pay the rent, there's you know collection down in that in that regard as well but if you look at the bounce back since then um and, and unfortunately we don't have more current data in the moment right but um there are additional uh, sources that we can point to to show that market rate rents have since skyrocketed right like in those same buildings where there was a mixed residential i mean mixed uh, rent stabilized market rate those same rents for market rate folks has gone through the roof and folks are starting to come back and pay those outstanding rents. So um, I just want to put that again in context um, for us as we move forward. 
There's a lot of pressures on those market rate rents that I mean, Shayla talked about supply. Certainly, there's pressure on rents if there aren't enough apartments. There's pressure on rents if market rate owners are anticipating some legislative changes, which four years in a row, you know, good causes back. Um, and so I think it's a reaction to <clears throat> what owners are sort of the landscape, what it looks like even for market rate owners, that there's a push to re-regulate 3 million, not just 1 million. Um, and I also think that we have an opportunity, hopefully, um, to get some more stabilized units back into circulation, so which would ease up on the skyrocketing market rate rents. I just, since we're going to talk about, you know, previous years and changes, I just want to highlight the fact that since, I don't know, what was it, the last, since 1990, NOI has increased by 49 percent in total. I mean, also there was the excessive hikes in the, during the Bloomberg era. So, I mean, like, while I understand yeah. the opposite position that, like, the HSTPA and rent laws and this over-regulation is somehow, um, you know, really making these landlords struggle, um, I, I want to just give us the full contextual picture here. Um, the other thing that I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up, just in terms of the process, and I'd like to hear more about the change, the change in the methodology um, from your year, because in my mind, I'm like, well, if the last audit that was actually issued yeah if the last if the last audit was issued or done rather back in that 30 years ago right why is it that the 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 decision becomes let's change the methodology rather than let's do additional audits right like i think that it's well past time to do dof audits because again rpi information and even the H, hr uh, the hcr information rather um that's all self-reported right so if we're trying to get the most accurate picture of what it is that landlords are actually expending and their costs, open up the books. I think that's a good point. And, and, and something I think we should discuss going forward is sort of the art of the possible on that. Obviously, as we talked about, there's a methodological shift to approximate what we think the current adjusted should be. Um, but it's a conversation, I think, to have with DOF about you know, what their uh, view on that is and whether we can improve that more. Um, and I think it's for me, particularly important to make sure that we're comparing as we think about the state of the portfolio and trends over time, that, that as we make this shift and think about ways of improving, we continue to be able to do apples to apples comparisons. Um, and I know, Brian, you had mentioned that when we look at the long-term longitudinal, right, it's adjusted for that, or uh, maybe say a word about that. Um, well, the longitudinal, I mean, we're only looking each year at two consecutive years, so but Sorry, the, the looking at the 1991. Oh, from the 1990, yeah. that is inflation adjusted, but it, it, yeah, it does look at the RPI across what we used to call cross-sectional data for each year. So if the, uh, that number is not re adjusted by the, uh, there's no expense adjustment, but uh, because if, if assuming that there is either what we used to be an 8% adjustment or this year is almost about a 5% adjustment, if that's similar year to year, Looking at the change over a period of time shouldn't shouldn't that shouldn't have any impact if there was uh, an overinflation of expenses or, um, but I mean I think also DOF I mean we, for years we've talked about doing an audit but it's just not possible but DOF does actually make adjustments for their assessment to the data uh, so to make sure it reflects um, what they think is accurate so it's not exactly what what the owners report verbatim um, so that's important to keep in mind. I'm just going to, oh, so I'm sorry. I've spoken to you. No, I spoke to you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I do feel like I, I always bring this up because I do feel like it's important to look at the data and the actual impact it has on people. And so I just want to highlight a few things. We saw rent collections the highest in the poorest communities, <laughs> um, higher incomes. We saw, from my reading of the data, NOI sort of, drop, um, and I think that sort of tells you a little bit about um, this conversation on our ERAP and who has, I feel like landlords were pretty maintained whole in communities where it was necessary for the state to step in, for one-shot deals to step in, and et cetera, and so I would love to think about as we go through the affordability on t uh, 
tenants affordability, sort of layering some of the data and having conversations that are a little bit more holistic about how the how we look at the data because it is, you know, areas that were had rezonings recently that we're seeing these collections at the highest rate, um, and communities that have higher lower incomes um, at, on average as well, and and communities that have also been uh, folks have moved from different areas. So think about Upper Manhattan, the Dominican community there, think about Harlem, think about downtown Brooklyn, and then we're seeing those folks going into the Bronx where incomes are lower and the impact of all this data and the collections um, I think is really interesting. Um, and at first when I started reading the report I was quite shocked, uh, sort of thinking about, oh wow, NOI dropped, how do I look at this data? And then I sort of looked at all of the rest and said, oh, it dropped because the market actually couldn't bear it in some communities, core Manhattan, and communities that are more affluent. Yeah, um, if you look at uh, page 19, the table there, I think it's quite interesting. Going back to Manhattan, um, you know, I think it's, as I said before, the market rate units drops, and decreases the income probably drive a lot of the decrease in NOI, but if you look at Manhattan across the different categories of percentage of stabilized housing, it's still a much higher decrease. Even 100% rent stabilized buildings, you see a 13% decrease, which is you know much higher than the other boroughs. Even in upper Manhattan, 100% stabilized buildings, 11% decrease in NOI. So I think something is different in Manhattan across the board. It's not just about market rate uh, units. The even rent stabilized units, we see a bigger decrease in NOI than in the outer boroughs. And I don't understand why exactly, but I think it's worth noting. I, I, I noted the same thing, Alex, and the one thing that it made me wonder about, and it's not in the report, but is this uh, uh, other income versus rental income question and whether there are aspects of the portfolio in Manhattan particularly that exaggerate the impact of non-rental income. Um, so you could imagine an overlay that is both the percentage of units in a building that are stabilized, but uh, mm -hmm. also overlaying that compared to whether or not even 100% rent stabilized has other income. So if there was a drop of commercial exactly. or other income. So I, you know, like in Upper Manhattan, which is more like the rest of the city, you still see a much higher decrease. Do you think that that has something to do with the flight that Adan was referring to earlier of like fee people fleeing from the city and not being able to rent those units yeah. for the period of COVID, yeah. especially I think that's, 2021? I think that's more likely the market rate units than the rent stabilized units, although this combines the uh, post-74 units, and they probably are going to have a higher vacancy rate, but, but they're, more they're perhaps less likely to be 100% rent stabilized, although I, I don't know. Um, I can't say whether it's in more Manhattan, but I know that anecdotally there's been reports of apartments that have become vacate, vacated since the 2019 Rent Reform Act of, where the owner is not re-renting it because they're not making renovations. It's tough to get a handle of how much the rent decline is because of that. But, but, um, but we that's are important going to be to getting data, uh, obviously, about supply, right? We do have a housing supply report. I'm not sure how much uh, will be uh, about that in particular. But I, I think you're referring to warehousing, right? So warehousing of units. So what are some of the obstacles that the RGB has in terms of collecting accurate data or to paint a uh, accurate picture of that because I think that's a large piece of this that would be really helpful to understand. I mean, it's sort of we, we look at the annual registration data from DHCR and we, the Housing and Vacancy Survey, but there's always a lag with that, so it's sort of tough to get a good idea. And um, that's self-reported, right? The registration. registration data is reported by by owners. So every year, HCR does data data for us, and certainly they'll give us the most current vacancy registration data they have. Right. Again, self-reported data that's, that, that HDR winds up getting, right? Yeah, it is right. owner-reported. Owner yeah. Sorry, if I just really quick. I mean, it's conceivable that we could also, you know, subpoena HDR for, <laughs> I mean, if we really wanted to, to, to take it a step further and really get actual disclosure of some of these documents and have a, a accurate painted picture, I think an audit and also getting the information one way or the other from DHCR might be helpful.
We do submit questions. I mean, the board members submit questions to DHCR that they typically answer, so that could, I'm not sure if it's been asked before, but that can certainly be added, I guess, later in the season. Do we know if they upgraded the system finally? <laughs> it's been nine years that I've been hearing Woody share these upgrades. <laughs> I don't want to spoil any sort of surprise. A surprise? No, actually, it's not a surprise. Um, uh, HCR is going to, from my understanding, going to come and talk. So okay. we can ask them at that time <laughs> uh, where they are with that. And to be clear, I meant HCR can subpoena the information from folks, just for clarity's sake. And they're really going to do that? Oh, it, they can, it, but will they? We d uh, uh, just regarding the vacant units, we did get a glimpse of the, the avail in the HVS, the limited data that was released for 2021 from HPD, that there was an uptake in the number of vacant and not available for rent units for whatever reason, but it doesn't that's only from 2021 and only from the HVS survey. And we're still waiting the full data set from that. I will say that as a person who's been on this board for nine years, I've been always pushed by the tenant movement to think about and have the conversation on specific neighborhoods where we believe where, house are, where housing is happening, like Chinatown, areas that are being either rezoned or landlords are sort of in a holding I think Christina sort of mentioned this. I do feel like if you have the luxury of holding on to units when we are seeing NOI overall change, I do feel like it, I think it's making a statement about what's going on. And I think the other side can disagree, but if you are strapped for cash and you really need to rent all these units out, I would assume you would want all of them in the market. Except, Shayla, <laughs> luxury? It's not a luxury. Yeah, it's definitely the not cost of getting these units back online. I mean, it's a whole other discussion that we could spend a day on. I so let's let's. I mean, yeah, those units are gonna. We can disagree actually, on that. Yeah, uh, we, no local until laws, the day, whatever, yeah. getting up to code, things that the, the cost of of really getting these units going, and if someone's living in a, in a rent stabilized unit for forty years, and you're not just gonna put it back online because guess what? To re rent it, you need there are things that need to be done. The sixty two cents per dollar to carry those units would be, yeah. We're talking about the, the owners are taking money out of their pocket to put those units back online, period. An investment. I'm sorry? An investment. I don't understand how it's an investment. You are upgrading your building, your property value goes up. It, it is an investment, it's property. We look at it as a business. I feel like we have to look at that aspect as well as a business. Part. You know there's a cap on what landlords are supposed to spend to put those units back online. If you have an empty rent stabilized unit, used to be you could spend to get a percentage of the expenditure. That ended, so now landlords are told that they can spend $15,000. They can elect to spend more, of course, but in return they're getting $83 permanent rent increase on a rent that's marked to a 30 year ago market. So it's really a poor business decision to put those units, it, it would actually put a building into bankruptcy if there were 10 units in a 12 unit building that needed to come back online with the math that the state of New York has given owners, they would lose the building, period. Yeah, not, not going to, looking again at that same table, you know, so warehouse units would presumably be reflected in income loss, and you see in Manhattan that there is a higher level of decrease uh, in uh, rental income or and total income than in the outer than the rest of the city. But you also have, as in the rest of the city, you know, very considerably high increases in uh, cost, and that's not reflect. You know, that is regardless of warehousing. So you can't attribute the uh, higher the loss of income just to that. Though it's clear that you know core Manhattan, is especially, but also um, upper Manhattan, you see losses of income, and the other parts of the city either are increases or much smaller losses of income. So it's not 
clear exactly why that is. It would need to be unpacked, but taking units out of, the, out of occupancy might be part of the story, but it's only part. Uh, the, in, the cost increases are substantial across the board. I, I, that's, I think that's true. Um, and at the same time, our mandate is to balance a fair market. And so if we know costs for everyone has gone up, and we know that the people who live in rent-stabilized housing are poorer, people of color, uh, in neighborhoods that have had recent rezonings, I mean, some of the data sort of shows it, I do feel like we're supposed to balance what a fair market would be. I feel like in other cities across the country, people are able to negotiate those rents when the market and there's strains in the market. In New York City, it's so unique, and I think the, legislat the legislator sort of reacted and I think the 2019 laws sort of put us in a place for me as an advocate where we needed to be because we were bleeding housing and because I feel like the loopholes that folks are crying foul about now were abused um, and we saw that because the rents were going up at rates even when we had zero percent uh, or adjustments. Um, and so I do feel like all of those things can be true um, and I do feel that the wins that we were able to get on the state level were as a reaction of what was happening for decades before. Sorry, my microphone wasn't on. I would just underscore, I think these are important conversations to ground in the information that we'll be getting um, as we move through the spring, and I hope we can keep coming back to it. Um, but any other questions for Brian? Okay, great. Um, anything else that we should discuss now? And obviously our next meeting will be on the 13th. We'll be doing the income and affordability study. Uh, and uh, Andrew and I are also working on, um, you know, uh, sort of other folks we can bring in as we have in the past. Um, uh, and, and, and we'll have more agenda items for the 13th as well. Uh, please. Yeah, and to, and to that, we're, we're certainly going to have our normal tenant landlord where you, yeah, come and present whatever data to the board. I, I was going to suggest that there are, there were folks, I, I feel like this is going to come up when we especially talk about the mortgage uh, report, but yeah. um, there were folks who were working on some of the signature work prior to the recent yeah. craziness that's been happening around bank um, and uh, have a ton of data that had, they had collected prior. I feel like we went to D.C. to talk to CRA about signature and some of their practices on multi housing uh, mortgages specifically um, that I think would be interested in. Some folks who did that work were ANHD, um, who, who we have had have testified in the past, um, and other folks uh, throughout the city, and I think that would be an interesting conversation to bring into the mix as we hear about the constraints uh, and the interest rate hikes that we've all experienced in our personal lives and our work lives. Thank you. No, I think that would be really good. All right, if there's no further business, uh, and I'll just want to make sure we don't. Great. Uh, is there a, oh, please, Shayla. You know, I like to get these things on the record on the first <laughs> hearing. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we are keeping all of the lines open of registration for testimonies for the auto borough hearings that we do. I feel like you were, we, people were able to register online, also call in on the day of, all that stuff will happen. Um, Right, uh, and commitment to make sure that the interpreter there's one interpreter at the registration to help people register, which you have done before. But just yeah, making sure that we center some of that. Yeah. Good, thank you. Really helpful. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. I second. Thank you so much, and thank you for a, a really helpful and productive first meeting. And thank you again, Brian. Thank you.